So I'll be giving an introduction on mutation testing and then uh, do a deep dive into some mutations for C++11 specifically. Uh, I'm Sev de Busser. I, uh, I work at Nokia. Uh, I do test infrastructure and this is also part of why I'm doing this talk. So let's start with why do we actually test? Uh, some reasons are to verify that your program behaves as the specifications say it should. Uh, others are uh, having the confidence to change your code for new requirements, knowing that the test will tell you if you break something. And there's an interesting issue. How do you know your test will actually tell you that you broke something? Uh, the most common way we usually do this is having some measure of how much of the code the test executes, so code coverage. Maybe you expand that into branch coverage to see how much different choices throughout the code your tests actually check. But most of the time, just code coverage. Uh, in our case, we use symbol coverage because uh, because uh, generating more data is too, uh, is too expensive. We can't take uh, a 50% performance hit to do full uh, line coverage. But coverage should give us some idea of how good our tests are. Why doesn't it? Uh, well, when people have coverage as a metric to see how good uh, they're testing, and then often it's put up from on high that the manager says we need to we need 90% code coverage. People start writing stuff like this, just a function somewhere in their code that it just can grow to be as big as they need to to have the overall statistic be 90%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it took on that. So, test confidence. What are ways to actually get that? Uh, one way is, especially in a project that lasts for several decades, just uh, get a statistics of how many bugs you catch in, catch in tests versus in production. Uh, what if we can speed that process up? So what if we take a source, in this case, there's an if test, and we change it to be either uh, smaller than or equal, not equal, larger than or equal. We run each of those through tests and check which are called by the test and which aren't. And then we use that as a score for the test suite. And we do that for all of the source code we're interested in and run all the tests every time, have an overall score. Uh, that's actually the basic overview of mutation testing. Mutator is the interesting part that actually does the thing and then, uh, yeah. But outside of killed and survived, it's also part of the survived mutants that we don't want because they actually didn't change anything about the behavior of the code. In the example before, uh, the the large the smaller than equal didn't actually get killed by a test, but maybe there is a guarantee that the only way it differs if it's if it is if it's bigger. So you have outside guarantees that it will never be smaller, so that test doesn't actually that mutation doesn't change anything about the code. So uh, we want to discard those as uh, for the uh, for the event for the uh, total score. Uh, the problem is that is a lot of manual labor because it requires human analysis of the code because static analyzers aren't usually there yet, and there are a lot of cases they won't be able to catch. Uh, one major example is uh, 
One classic example of a mutation that should always be different is changing a plus to a minus. But if you have a piece of code that, uh, that checks if the sum of a list of numbers is 0, it doesn't matter if you use plus or minus. So that's a reason why, why automatically detecting the equivalent mutants and discarding them is really hard. It's basically a halting problem. Uh, so what can you get out of mutation testing? Uh, you could get an overall score of your test suite. Uh, you could uh, get a score of every test at how good a particular test is at catching bugs in the code it executes. Uh, another thing you can get is redundant tests. If you have several tests that all kill exactly or almost exactly the same set of mutants, they might be testing the exact same thing, and you might be able to throw one out and have your test suite execute faster. Uh, and one other thing that I found personally is functionally dead code. Code that gets executed has side effects, but they don't actually matter to the end result. Uh, this happens a lot when you're dealing with complex code, you have some later refactorings, and then it turns out a complicated piece of logic the results of it always get overridden later, even though it still runs. And I could remove like a dozen lines of very complicated conditionals to find an edge case, because later in the code, there was a guarantee that it would always get found there, because that was a better place to find that case. Uh, so keeping that in mind, Let's go over what choices you need to make if you want to start doing mutation testing. Uh, first level uh, of choice is uh, what, what the thing is you're actually mutating. You can have the most uh, simple tool uh, that looks at source code, changes the source code, the big disadvantage here is that you need to compile and link every single mutant. You need to go through the whole compile cycle, and for some code bases, that is really heavy to do. Uh, another option is doing mutation at the LLVM IR level. These are exactly the same mutations, just in IR syntax, uh, where you can then use a JIT to then uh, only compile and link in the small mutation, and all the rest is already compiled and linked. So that gives a way faster feedback loop. The problem is that not all mutations at this level have a representation at a source, so it might not actually be a bug a programmer could make, so it's not really worth testing for, and those need to be filtered out, which is, again, a hard problem. Uh, and if you want to go even further, you can even mutate binary, literal assembly code, and then you get even more speed advantage, but even more garbage mutants that don't have representation in the code. So it's trade-off. Like how important is it that the feedback loop is fast, which is very important because uh, if you're mutating every single plus in the code to a minus one by one, or a minus remove a minus one, or uh, change all these checks into multiple mutants, it's it's a lot of computation time. Uh, so let's talk about where in the code to put mutations, which is another configuration choice you make with the tools. Uh, so locations, uh, you can just mutate all of the code, uh, which will give you the most uh, direct analog to code coverage. But uh, if code is not covered, those mutants won't get actually hit by any test, but you will run the whole test suite and waste a lot of time. If you have coverage information, I'm not saying coverage isn't good, I'm only saying 
is not good as a metric for how good your tests are, uh, you can only generate mutants in covered code. Uh, but if you want to then use the result you get out of that as a general statistic, you need good test coverage. You need good coverage to start with. Uh, a small distinction to this is directly covered codes, where the idea is that tests only really test codes up to three levels of the call stack. And anything deeper is probably library code that should have separate tests. Because test testing uh, something that's called five, six levels deep in the call stack is unlikely to find the bug in that thing, but in how it is used instead. And one more, uh, instead of running it over your whole code base, you could, and you probably should if you have a large enough code base, only run it on code that's actually actively developed and not code that has been basically an internal library for 20 years and we already know that it works well because we stopped finding bugs and it's still in heavy use. I'm gonna let him take a picture. <laughs> so, next up, the mutator itself. Which mutants are we actually going to generate? Uh, on simple ones, like what I already said, replacing operators. So an A, a plus can be replaced by a minus, a multiply or divide. Uh, that one, those are pretty simple. Uh, statement deletions. Uh, for statements with no, uh, they are not required for the rest of the logic of the code to still compile. So all void calls, all C out calls, whatever, uh, can remove them and see if the tests catch that you're not having this side effect anymore. Uh, you can, of course, uh, start mutating object-oriented programming constructs. So here we have a parent with a virtual function, a child with that function that overrides it. Thing is, the parent has an implementation. So what if we remove the implementation in the child? It will now always call in the parent. If, uh, if tests don't check that the uh, stuff that the child is different from the parent actually happens, you need to check for that. Another interesting thing, which might make some people think of how hard it is to test for this, training constructs. You have two log guards that take two mutexes in order. What if you switch them around? There are tools that are specifically made to, uh, to do these kinds of mutations, to check that you have good threading tests. Uh, links at the end of the presentation. Uh, some optimizations in generating mutants. Uh, you have mutants kamata, uh, which is the idea that you only generate mutants once and then choose between them at runtime with a global flag. So instead of you mutate this to an immediately invoked lambda that then switches which side effect it does uh, at runtime based on mutant selector. Uh, also for the generation and testing actually, uh, distribute it, uh, use a server farm. So you throw every single file you have or you use some other division method uh, to different nodes in your network. They each do uh, mutation testing on that file and then throw the results back to a main collector, uh, which can, of course, give you an almost perfect parallel speed up because each of those things can be done completely in parallel because each test runs independent of the others because you're only testing one mutant at a time. Uh, moving on to the testing itself. How do you run tests? Do you run all tests every single time? If you don't have coverage information, that's basically all you can do. Uh, do you look at what tests actually cover the mutant you made and only run those tests? Uh, 
you can change in what order you run the test. If you want a total result for the test suite, you can do this and use tests that either already run quickly or that have already proven themselves over time to be very good mutant killers to run them first, so you get results faster. And you don't need to run the longer running tests because the mutant has already been killed. Uh, something else that tools need to do is check for infinite loops that it introduced. So uh, adjust timeout time dynamically by seeing what the code base does if it hits an infinite loop. Uh, one tool I know does this, uh, also link at the end. Uh, it starts at like a timeout of five seconds, but it's configurable. And then when it notices an infinite loop, it's, uh, it then dynamically changes the timeout it uses uh, to have a better idea of uh, what is infinite loop and what is just the program taking a bit longer than usual. Uh, oof, I'm actually going way faster through my slides than I thought I was. Already half my way through my thing and I'm we're only 15 minutes in. Well, time to make this info dump longer. <laughs> so, mutation design, this was what I actually did for my master's thesis. Uh, so, the main problem in mutation design is that you want to make mutations that resemble bugs that programmers would make uh, and that would be able to go through code review and be overlooked because there's small changes and that stuff. Uh, so we have a very similar graph to the earlier one, but here we have the set of all mutants. We have the valid ones, so the ones that compile. And then we have the equivalent ones. And equivalence is uh, the main problem in design because you need to at least try to uh, remo remove as many of those as possible so that there's less human effort involved after the fact. Uh, and here's my actual example that I used earlier because I didn't think, like, yeah. So, uh, so let's start with the first operator I made. So, initialize this constructor for a uh, vector and string and aggregates, etc. Uh, so in C plus eleven, you can create a vector of names with just the names in there, and it will allocate the array in the backend and just fill it. Uh, so you have curly brackets, and then you have a constructor of vector that creates a vector of twenty Johns. How many Johns are in the audience? Probably not many. <laughs> I tried to pick a name that was common, uh, but. It's interesting. What happens if you use uh, if you use this with integral integral types? So we have a vector of five times forty two, and you fill that vector uh, using iota, so it will be zero, one, two, three, four. What happens if you change the brackets to curly brackets? Anyone want to make a guess? Two elements. Yeah, what happens when you, we run the exact same code? Zero and one. Uh, the size is not taken from the vector. Oh. This is code I've seen. Boom. That's what you get. If you're lucky. Otherwise, you're just going to start overwriting random data that's after the vector thing, and you might corrupt some heap. Uh, some heap structures. So uh, after we decide that this is an interesting one, uh, we need to do some analysis. Are there cases that we can detect statically in a tool where it is where the code does the exact same thing? And yes, there is. Two two. There's another case where uh, 
where actually if the initializer list constructor wouldn't compile, it uses the other constructor. Uh, yeah, curly brackets fall back on normal constructors if initializer list doesn't overload correctly. Uh, that was really fun to find out. I figured it out like three days before the conference. <laughs> uh, invalidity, when doesn't it compile? And like, if you can detect this beforehand, we don't need another compile cycle. That will then error out. Uh, uh, if you do the, uh, the operator in the op other direction, which is also interesting, uh, these curly brackets now don't work anymore. So but yeah, this is pretty trivial to check in a tool that this won't compile. Uh, this is a very simple operator. I really should have put my fourth operator in here. <laughs> so range for loop. Again, to give you the theme, we have a vector of names. And we're going to change the first letter of each name to lowercase. And yes, I know this doesn't work with Unicode. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then you get Seth and Cynthia. What? There's a there's one little character. There. There. <laughs> <laughs> Remove that ampersand, and suddenly you're just changing a copy of each name. So the vector stays the same. So, yeah. This is something that uh, STL warned about in a talk at CppCon 2014, I think. Where there was a panel, and they, each member of the panel had to say what's the worst feature of C++. And it was like having this as default. Because this is a mistake people make. And that's my inspiration for this. So equivalence, if this compiles. If you only use const methods uh, on each member, then you're not actually <laughs> changing it. So doing the stuff with the copy or doing the stuff with a real thing <coughs> doesn't change. So yeah. So a tool can just try compiling this instead and seeing if it works. And if it works, it's going to be equivalent. We can throw it away. Uh, when this operator doesn't work and will not compile, if this thing is not copyable. This won't work. So we need to check for that. But yeah, checking for copyability is also pretty trivial. Uh, there are more uh, interesting equivalence cases, but that usually boils down to calling a function that takes it by reference but doesn't actually mutate it. But if the tool can't see the implementation of the function, or it would require a lot of heavy static analysis, yeah, you can't easily check for that automatically, so that's left to the humans afterwards. And now we come to lambdas. Uh, I'll start with a simple function that just adds miss to the front of the name. Uh, we have, again, the vectors, vector of names. We transform, and we put miss in front of each of our, our names. Uh, but what if you want to like, do it as a one-liner? You can write lambda there. What if you want to, uh, to make the thing you're adding to it uh, a variable so you can change it at runtime? Uh, then you make it a variable, and you capture it by value, so it gets copied into the lambda. And then you uh, add, and you do the same thing. What you can then do is make this prepender actually a function that returns such a lambda, and then have prepender with misses, and then you get again the same result. What happens if you don't capture by value, but by reference? So now that lambda there holds a reference to the argument prepend, which then gets returned. So you get a reference to a local variable out of scope. 
These are a few results I managed to co coax out of some compilers. So you can get garbled results, you can get a crash, you can get... You can actually get the right result, which is a problem. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's uh, another mutator, which I had real much fun designing. Uh, so again, equivalence. Uh, first up, if the capture list is actually empty or equivalent to capturing this pointer, changing value capture to reference capture doesn't change anything, so that's done. Or if the, uh, the lambda is being passed into something that only uses it locally, you can use either and it will work because it, the variables never go out of scope. Uh, passing it into something is, uh, is dangerous if it ends up getting stored somewhere and then run on a different thread or something because then it's very likely to be out of scope and go boom. Uh, Invalidity is was really hard to find because it will just compile. Like capturing by reference will always compile. There's no no way outside of having decal type static asserts inside of the lambda to check if you captured by value or reference to make it not compile. But I found a way. Touch W error. Compilers warn about returning reference to local variables, even if they're inside of a lambda. And that brings me to something Phil has mentioned several times in his course. Compilation as test. Because we said that like invalid mutants, they just don't compile, so they're not interesting for the score of the test suite. But what if you use uh, compile time tests? What if you use static asserts as part of your test suite? What do we do then? Do we count them as killed mutants? Or do we count them as invalid mutants? But then you don't get a good idea of how good your compile time test suite is. Uh, catching bugs. This is a really interesting problem. I've had hour long discussions with several people about this. And we can't find a good answer. So if anyone has ideas, feel free. <laughs> and it turns out I managed to go through all my slides in half an hour. Oops, I should have done the right runs. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah, before this talk, I and a colleague uh, discussed what could be uh, interesting mutants. And he, he suggested um, maybe error handling code, if you were able to remove error handling parts of your code, for example, catch clauses or identify if bra else branches that have this error. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be typically never invalid and, and, and probably never equivalent to the original code. Do Likely. you think that is a possible and a good idea? Or can uh, yeah, if you can have uh, a way to detect those and well, I went to Phil's talk earlier on errors, and their error handling stuff has a very specific syntax, but it's also mostly statically checked, so it might suddenly become invalid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's indeed an interesting mutation, and I don't think I've actually seen a tool do that. Because you would detect failure to test error cases. In your test but uh, the thing is that... Uh, Checking for an error, uh, oftentimes that happens in like a separate if block that just has an early return of return error. Uh, there are mutations that just invert the condition of an, uh, of an if. So that will have the same effect. So mutation tools will likely already have uh, mutations that will end up being that without actually remove trying to uh, figure out what code is error handling code and what the code is regular code and remove the error handling specifically. Uh. Yeah. What tools do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
The first two are source level tools. The second two are IR tools. The last one is uh, is a binary level tool. The last one actually, I can't find a public download for it, only the academic paper. Uh, so you might need to contact the authors if you want it. Uh, but the others are all downloadable. Uh, Dextool mutate and use uh, Dextool mutate is the is mostly just regular C++ mutations, like mutating expressions, if conditions, uh, removing calls to void or replacing a call with a value of that type, just hard-coded, uh, those kind of things. Um, UCBP uh, does those things, has several of those mutators, but also has uh, object-oriented programming mutations. Uh, not only like removing an implementation, but also like uh, inserting direct calls to parent implementations or uh, toying with dynamic costs, that kind of stuff. Uh, MUL is, uh, is an IR level tool that uh, basically also does all the basic mutations. Uh, but it works at IR and it's proven to be relatively fast. They managed to uh, do mutation tests of the LLVM code base. So that's quite impressive. Uh, it's done by uh, Alex Denisov and some other people uh, and they were on CPPcast. So you might want to go look that episode up. Uh, CC Mutator is a mutation tool on, uh, on threading stuff. It also works at IR level, and it just plays with all of the POSIX calls that happen underneath. And XEMU uh, is based on QEMU, so it uh, does emulation, but it's handy for uh, verifying stuff you don't have a source code for, but only binary. So you can see if your test actually verify the stuff inside of things you can't, uh, you can't mutate at source or IR level. Uh, so maybe some embedded folks might want to check it out. Uh, yeah. Um, I was curious whether you've had any issues with in C++ using overloaded operators, if operators are one of the key mutation points, if that's proven to be a particular, particularly difficult thing to test. Uh, well, uh, to test or to do mutations on? To do mutations on. Uh, well, tools can check if you can subtract before generating that mutation. Mm -hmm. uh, at, the RR, at the IR level, that just turns into calls, so you, you have no real... Uh, there are other muta mutations that then just call another function or something, but... Uh, yeah, at the source level, it will just replace it and hope that it compiles or checks that it will compile. But yeah, uh, if you have a good type system, a lot of mutations won't be possible, so you'll get a good score. <laughs> if you count things that are killed by the type system or other compiler checks as, uh, as killed and not as invalid, which is this problem. Peter? Uh, I've seen it a number of times that when coworkers change code, they don't just change one tiny thing, they change a couple of related things and then manage to mess something up. Yeah. Have you tried um, having a multiple mutators run on similar or related code and see if that makes or catches more bugs? Uh, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, but there is research at like higher level mutations, like stuff that does more than uh, just single, uh, and there's somewhat of uh, conflict in the between the papers because some papers say these low-level mutations give basically the same results as the high-level mutations, but then others say that the high-level mutations have an advantage because there will be less of them, so you don't need to run as many rounds. But the tools doing those are also more complex, so they have more processing time before they can a mutation so yeah 
I was uh, triggered by your slide in which you move a function in uh, a lambda into a separate function, where the function has a parameter that could be by reference or by value, and then the lambda captures by value or by reference. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there's a combination of four options here. Uh, I'm not thinking quickly enough to figure out if that's making a difference, but I'd say that those two might uh, might find an additional bug. Uh, yeah. Here, uh, this slide was actually just me building up to this being the actual source code. Yes. Because I was not sure how many people knew how lambdas worked. So I was trying to build up to it instead of throwing a function that returns another function at your face. But if you take that function and yeah. you change the capture to by reference, it will capture the local variable, which is going to break. Yeah. If you change the uh, arguments to a reference as well, that's not going to change anything. But if you change both, it will probably keep working. Because uh, you have a reference to the outside string, uh, if it's not a temporary in that case. Yeah. Well, in this case, the no, this temporary doesn't live beyond the prepender call, does it? Now, in this case, it wouldn't have helped. If it's an external uh, variable, uh, passing it in as a reference would work. And then capturing that by reference would work and not yeah. crash. Yeah. So that might be uh, more, more interesting things. But it also makes it explode in complexity. <laughs> like, uh, there are also mutators that, uh, let me just go back to these slides if people want links. Uh, there are mutators that, like, uh, that give a reason to use strong types. Because if there's a function that takes multiple arguments of the same type, uh, some muta mutators just switch their order around and see what happens. Uh, there are lots of fun mutations to do. So how much do you need? I mean, if you want to get your first mutating thing to run, how much setup, how, much, how hard is it to? to uh, most of these. Uh, pretty much just need a client compilation database, and they can start. Uh, uh, Dextil mutate is Clang based. MuCPP, I'm. It's also Clang based, so that will also. Yeah, actually, both the the source level and the IR level mutators here are all Clang based. So if your code base compiles with Clang, or you can hack a compilation database together with something else like. Uh, I use something at our code base because we compile GCC and Clang doesn't really like some of our source files. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a tool that uh, that basically wraps the make command and then sees all the compiler invocations. Uh, that will also give you a compilation database. Uh, so yeah, most of these tools you just need a compilation database and. Uh, A little bit of configuration to make the choices of the things you want, like which parts of the code base you want to mutate, what mutators to turn on or off, uh, that kind of thing. And then you can basically run them. Uh, most of these have pretty easy setup if you have a somewhat sane build system. Is the compilation database the same as CMake would be able to export? Is that the same compilation database? Uh, it's a big JSON file that Clang tools can use. So if you can use Clang tools on your code base, you can use these. Yeah, I think with CMA you can spit out a Ninja file, and then with Ninja you can spit out a compilation database. I can't quite remember, but there's, there should be a way with CMA. I know that CMA has a compilation database you can export. That's a giant JSON file with compile commands for each of the source files. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah. That's yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Didn't know CMA could. It? No, CMA has to be able to do that for. Yeah, CMA can do that. There's uh, multiple other build systems that can also do that. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Uh, when, when you set up this um, in real use in production, is it like there's a CI server running these tests and spitting out all the survivors with associated mutations for into a database that people can look at afterwards and analyze? Or is it That's a setup you can do, yeah. Uh, these tools usually... Uh, uh, well, I can actually just go to one of them and see the documentation. Malice. Well, now I'm going to need to... Let me just... Let me 
just duplicate. That makes that makes it simple. So this is small. Uh, it has IDE integration with some IDs uh, with Xcode. Uh, so you can see which one survived or what what it, what the tool did. Uh, <coughs> yeah, now. I'm uh, How long does it take? Uh, I don't actually have numbers. Sorry. Uh, but yeah. Uh, well, here you can see they did uh, they did mutation testing on OpenSSL, and with the timings, uh, Two minutes. a few minutes. But that's with a good rest, uh, to, yeah, two minutes-ish for OpenSSL, which is not that big of a code base, but quite a complicated one. So. And then, yeah, warnings and stuff. Uh, what did I do on LLVM? Wait, they only did a, s no, this is uh, format lib. I know they also did uh, did it on part of LLVM, but uh, it doesn't seem to be in this readme, whatever. Uh, yeah, it can be pretty fast. At IR level, you only need to recompile from IR to, to binary and just JIT that in. So only that part will be maybe a little bit slower than the rest of the code. I don't know. I don't know all the details of uh, Mel. For that, uh, go ask Alex Denisov on Twitter or something. <laughs> so it look like the uh, range of um, mutations that are available are pretty much just decided by the tool, or are any of them configurable so you can have your own? Uh, well, most of these tools are open source, so you could at your own if you know enough about uh, writing LLVM code. Uh, well, Clank Frontend was, well, uh, Mull is LLVM, but uh, text tool mutate is at source level, so you would write Clang matchers and those things. Uh, actually, a friend of mine is now doing his PhD on uh, making a distributed version of Dex tool. So that might be a feature that's coming. <laughs> And have you run any mutation testing on any of the mutation testing tools themselves? <laughs> 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 I haven't. Maybe they have done that on their own code, but. Is there some uh, obvious change uh, that could be made uh, to the C++ language to make the mutation simpler? Uh, well, the thing is, there's a reason all of these tools are basically all based on Clang, because Clang is the only parser that's easily to hook into. Uh, and the C++ language is very heavy uh, to parse. Uh, turns out I was able to uh, find all of my mutation sites with just grab, because my mutations are pretty simple and easy to grab for. Uh, but others aren't. Uh, I actually didn't have the time to build those mutators. And there's uh, the team of new CPP was working on it, but then the uh, priorities got changed and they needed to get some PhD out fast and at some other conferences they needed. So uh, might be a while until we actually get an implementation of those. If they're found useful. My numbers say they are, but <laughs> only checked a few code bases. Any more questions? Is that an early lunch?